that I need you. The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. Hey, Church Planner, this is Pete Mitchell. And this is Peyton Jones. And you are lucky enough to have tuned into what could possibly be the best episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Yeah, it's a little, little bit different. You know, Pete, I got a... Uh... But here's the reason why it's the best. It's not really you and me talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. You know what? I, I guess because I took a break from hardcore, or maybe it's because I was traveling. I don't, I don't remember. I think we... We did something kind of like this for one of our uh, episodes. I had a guy from South America write me and say, hey, are you and Pete okay? You know, is everything all right? I Like, I haven't heard from you guys normally in a while. <laughs> Dude, the best was, uh, okay, so we've got a thing called the Bible Inner Circle, which you're actually going to hear about today a little bit uh, from a from an insider's perspective. And um, one of the guys in there, so we, we do uh, two mastermind calls a month. And so this last one we had was uh, the very first Saturday of the month. So what was that? Like last week or something like that. Mm. And um, so one of the guys, one of the new guys in the Bible inner circle, he goes, Hey, uh, uh, my question is this. uh, You guys didn't have a church planner podcast release this week. Uh, What's going on? (laughs) So I'm like, well, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you heard this, but uh, Peyton's mom is, is sick and not doing that well. And in fact, he had to have his last conversation with her on the phone and, you know, um, so he was, he was out of town and, and do you feel guilty yet about harassing us about not having the church runner? <laughs> and he goes, no, <laughs> That's rad. And I'm like, okay, then you're one of us. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we should actually tell him what we got in store for them today because we actually don't have much time for smack talk. I, I added it up, and it's like uh, about sixty minutes of uh, of coolness that we're gonna yeah release. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny if you guys are new to our podcast. Um, what we normally do is we kind of screw around a bunch and do this thing called smack talk. And I was talking to Brandon Brooks, our old friend. He's he's a actor in Hollywood, and he's a he's a faithful listener. But he was like, man, I I. I wouldn't change a thing. He goes, I just think you need to warn new people because I don't think they know what in the heck they've just walked into. The the other funny thing is this this week I I had a um I had someone uh write me in and I, I had a phone call with them yesterday and they're starting a church planning podcast and they just wanted some advice and so really cool guys and I know one of the guys and really respect them. So I was like, Yeah, man, let's talk, you know. I'll, always happy to help. The competition, no, I'm teasing. It, it, you know, it was funny because he started off. He asked me, he said, um, "Hey, you know, uh, I need some pointers." And I was like, "Look, man, we're probably not the people you want to ask because I do this to help church planners, and so does Pete. But that's only half the story. The other half, and the reason the episode's broken up like it is, is because we're also just doing this for us, <laughs> yes. right? That's totally <laughs> it. Or like, and you so know, I, what? Well, look, if you want to, like. Find guys that do, you know, the marketing research. And I mean, we, you know, our podcast is huge, but, um, if you want to find guys that, that are like trying to really be successful, like that's their goals to be the biggest, uh, you know, I know guys who are out there following all those rules and maybe you should talk to them. And he goes, no, he goes, those podcasts, they're not like your podcast. And he goes, <laughs> I, I literally, he goes, you guys have hit on something by just being real guys. He goes, and I, and I, and I told him, I said, that's the funny thing is that when we bump into people, they immediately start joking around with us. So it's not, it's not like, Oh, uh, hello, Peyton. It's all nervous. And I mean, we've had people, you, you got your story about people being nervous, but. I see that. I thought that was the best. Andrew was uh, applying to come into the business growth consulting course. And I'm on the phone with him and his wife, and he goes, I, I just got to let you know, I'm really nervous right now because, you know, I listen to the podcast and I'm talking to a celebrity. <laughs> I'm like, 
a celebrity. Oh man, I, I feel sorry for it's you. It's so funny, man, because the the reality is we we actually um, it, this is our normal reaction. We meet somebody and they immediately just want to like have smack talk with Dude, us. Dude, when we meet someone, my first thought is, oh crap, are they mad at me? <laughs> like literally that's the first thought <laughs> that I have is, oh, how did I offend this person? I was up in Burbank at the um, NAM uh, Los Angeles assessment and it, it covers a good kind of chunk of Southern Cal. And so people were from kind of all over SoCal there and. Um, I was getting it. We were doing some films. We were doing some training films for assessors. And um, when I turned around, uh, we were clearing out of the room and the marriage and family therapist uh, guy was coming in. And, you know, I said something just, you know, kind of funny as we're on our way out, something completely inappropriate, I'm sure. And he, he, he looks over and he goes, it is so funny to be having a conversation with you right now. He goes, I'm used to hearing your voice. I, having like your voice come out of like a living body, like a real person, living tissue. He goes, it's so weird. It's just surreal. And he was just laughing. And so we started joking around. I realized, you know, he's, he's listening to the podcast, but that's kind of, that's kind of the reaction is normally people want to goof off. And I, I dig that man. Cause well, that, one that of my is favorites, what church planning is one of my You're favorites not around anyone who's impressed with you. You're literally just around people who don't know who in the heck you are. And that's where I'm in my element, man. Yeah. I feel better. Like I've got people coming over Saturday night. They, they don't have any clue that I'm an author. You know, they don't, they don't, they're not impressed that I'm on a podcast. They're just people. I wouldn't be impressed either with. if you listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't hang out with us if they listen to this. I think the best is, uh, 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 Tyrone, formerly known as White Tyrone. He, every time I talk to him on the phone, he's like, man, I'm just so used to listening to you at two times speed. <laughs> Can you please talk faster? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So those of you guys that, that, that don't know. So we have this Voxer group and this is what we're going to play for you today. Pete will intro way better than me. But we have people that talk really slow on it. So we learned that there was like a one, two and three times speed. And four times. And a four. And there there is there is maybe two people <laughs> yes. on Voxer that I know of that. They require a four time speed because they also happen to leave like four or five minute long messages. And that adds up after a while. It so, does. you know, if you can take it down to one minute, it's great. But then they sound kind of like normal speed when you put them on four. <laughs> but uh, then there's other people. So, like Barry Waters, you can't put Barry even on double speed. I find that it's funny. You're, you're absolutely right. And I thought it was because of his Welsh accent, which is mm -mm. so slight. It's but I was like, dude, I can't speed him up. Wales. Is that what they it is? Very fast. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any Anybody who's got an accent, I can't. Like, because we've got, here's the thing, guys. We've got this thing called Bivo Inner Circle. And, uh, and you're going to hear today on the podcast uh, part of our Voxer group because it was so on fire. I was like, we have to use this as a podcast. So the Bivo Inner Circle was originally started as a way where Peyton and I could uh, really invest more time and energy into wait for it by vocational pastors, uh, hence by the winner circle. So, um, so most of, of what we've got, we've got this thing called the Voxer chat group. So Voxer is an app on your iPhone, your Android or your desktop computer. And we've got a, a private chat where everyone who's in the program is in the private chat and you're able to hit a button and you can push to talk, um, Think of it as like a voicemail on demand where you can all hear each other's messages. So guys will be in there. Hey, you know what? Um, here's a problem that I got. Does anybody have any suggestions for this? And other guys will chime in with an answer. And most of the time it's business related because they're, they're all coming through either my business growth consulting course, my, uh, social media consulting course, or, um, we just actually launched a new program, how to create an online training program that benefits pastors and or the church. So, you know, we've got people that are the primary reason they joined was for that, right? Mm. They, they're bivocational and they're like, how can I make more money? And uh, what it's kind of grown to, in fact, I got a message this morning. So you can, you know, voice message in, you can actually video in, or you can uh, uh, type like texting into the group. And so guys do all three based on where they're at because they're bivocational. Some guys might be working a job and so they can't, uh, they can't speak into it. So they'll, they'll type a message in stuff like that. And one of the guys actually, uh, 
texted me this morning uh, in a private chat. And he's like, hey, you know what? Uh, I thought this was going to be all about business, but I realized God's using this for so much more. And he's like, for some guys, this is a place of healing. For other guys, this is like the only group of people where they can share what's actually going on in their lives. Yeah. Because we, I mean, yesterday we had some deep conversations going on. Uh, one of the pastors was like, guys, there's no one else I can really go to. So I'm coming to you guys. Here's what's going on in my family. I need some prayer and some advice. And then you just see the pastors, man, just stepping up. And you guys know this. If you are a pastor or a church planner, you know how rare it is to be able to have someone who you can kind of like let behind the curtain, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's hard with people on your staff. Sometimes the problems might be with someone on your staff. And you're like, you know, who can I talk to about this problem? Um, But it's just, it's one of those things where this thing has literally taken on a life of its own. And when we have people join the the Bible Inner Circle, I'm like, look, if you're not going to get on the Voxer group, you're really not going to understand how powerful this thing is. Mm. And, And I'm like, you know... It was almost like an afterthought when we were putting together the program, and it has become like the linchpin of the whole thing. Yeah. So it, let me just let me just uh, set this up, Peyton, and then you can say whatever you want to say. So what we're going to play for you guys are the voice message section. Uh, Ed Choi, one of the guys in my business growth consulting uh, course, he's uh, known as the wedding pastor. So he's actually putting together and about ready to launch. A, a program showing pastors, here's how you can create additional income being a, a wedding pastor and how he uses it to reach the unchurched in his community. And it just so happens to pay him because he's doing their wedding. So it's kind of a mm-hmm. kind of a win-win there. And um, so he throws out to the group the other day, he goes, hey, guys, why are you a bivocational pastor? I'm really looking for some insight so I can put this on. Uh, he does a thing called Wedding Wednesdays on Facebook Live. and I'm telling you, man, the conversations from there were just unbelievable. Mm. They were so good. I, I like was texting Peyton. Peyton was on a train. I'm like, dude, are you listening to the Voxer group? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is amazing. And and I'm like, okay, we gotta we gotta share this. So understand this. There are some messages that are way too private, and so you need to be a part of Bible Inner Circle because it's not for the public. It's mm. it's private. Like we had a lot of stuff going yesterday yep. with one of the people who's who's really hurting. And, you know, that's private. If you're not in the Bible inner circle, that's not for you at all. Not not only that, it was funny because, you know, part part of what the Bible inner circle does is it gives you access to not only Pete and I, um, you know, uh, you know, all day, but it also gives you access to the network. And I literally felt like I do it when I'm planning a church. I used to tell my church, hey, if you're not in a small group, um, don't come to me with a pastoral issue. Because if this works right, most of your pastoral issues mm. get worked out in your small group. And I'm there for the big stuff. And uh, and what what happens in this group yesterday, I'm listening, I'm listening to one of the problems. And everybody fed in. I literally, at the end of that, there was so much wisdom in this group speaking into this guy's life, I literally just came on and quoted a few of them and said, I have nothing to add. <laughs> you did. You, know? you did. Yeah. It was like, you, th- these are exactly the things I would have pointed out. It was, it was rich, man. And it's so much richer because it's that wisdom found in the multitude of counselors that quite frankly, leaders never get. Yeah. It's special, man. We did not expect it to become this. Right. We didn't know it was going to turn into this. We, we won't take up any more of your time because it, you're going to get a lot of great stuff out of this. So what's going to happen is we've actually pieced together all the different clips. And uh, and every once in a while, you'll notice, hey, I, I don't understand what he's referring to because it could have been someone texted in a message and someone was responding to the text message. Obviously, we can't play that on a podcast. So all you're getting are the voicemail pieces. You won't necessarily know who they are unless they say what their name is. We We know who they are because... It shows up in the Voxer chat group, you know, who's saying, uh, leaving the message. Um, but it doesn't matter. Like, you're going to get so much out of this. I actually think uh, if you are a bivocational pastor or a full-time pastor 
uh, or on staff at a church who's thinking, you know, how do we do church planning and stuff like that? I would almost make listening to this particular episode of the podcast mandatory mm. because uh, they address a lot of the issues that pastors are going through, whether they are full time ministry pastors or bivocational uh, pastors. And so it's, I'm, I'm really excited to bring this one to you guys and, and would just encourage you to, to definitely listen to it all the way through because you're going to get a ton out of it. If you want to know about joining the Bivo Inner Circle, you can head on over to BivoInnerCircle.com and, uh, we've got some, some webinars and stuff. Uh, you know, I think eventually we'll, we'll have to actually make a page that breaks out what the Bivo Inner Circle is. Right now, I know if you head on over to BivoInnerCircle.com, you're going to see the webinar offering one of our, our, uh, uh, business growth programs. Um, and it comes, everything is, is built around the Bible Inner Circle. It's really hard to explain until you watch the webinar. So just go watch the webinar and then you'll understand it. But, uh, anything uh, else you want to add to that, Peyton, before we just kick that Only off? Only that today's episode is also brought to you by <laughs> reachingtheunreachbook.com, which, uh, by the way, this is, this, this is kind of funny. My wife was making fun of me last night and she was like, How's the book doing? And I said, it's actually doing really good. It's, it's number one in church growth and number one in evangelism, but she laughed that it was number one in church growth. That is kind of funny. So anyway, Peyton had to jump off the phone real quick. He had an emergency call come in. So anyway, uh, this episode's also, as he said, being brought to you by reaching the unreached book.com. Uh, you can, Head on over to Amazon and you can actually just look up Peyton Jones or Reaching the Unreached. It'll absolutely come up. Phenomenal book. Go ahead and pick that up. And uh, and anyway, enjoy this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys are all having a fabulous Tuesday. It's always a great Tuesday uh, on my end because Tuesday is uh, family night, and uh, which means Chick-fil-A. So I'm gearing up for Chick-fil-A and uh, as those of you who know about Chick-fil-A know there's just never a bad day when you have Chick-fil-A. So anyway, I digress. So uh, some of you know that I've been doing a weekly um, uh, Facebook Live video, kind of ramping up, getting ready for my webinar. And uh, so I, I'm thinking about doing something a little bit different the next two weeks. I was inspired by a podcast that I listened to to put together kind of, uh, I don't know, almost like an authoritative, pay that's not the right word, but almost like an authority blog post on uh, being bi bi vocational. So Pete, uh, I don't remember if you have a blog or not, if you write, um, but I would love to connect with you. I would love to put you in the Bivo group and everything that you do as one of the core resources on that, um, as well, of course, as the Wedding Pastors Network. But here's my question for all of you. Would you all be willing to just really briefly, I feel like I just sat on something that was wet. Would you just uh, briefly uh, answer this question? Uh, why are you bivocational? And it, what benefit has being bivocational brought to your personal life and your ministry? If you could answer that just briefly, tomorrow on my video tomorrow, I think what I'm going to do is I'm not going to do the webinar format because um, I feel like I've just kind of been doing the same thing week after week, which is fine. But I'm going to take a little different twist on it. And I think what I'm going to do is uh, mainly talk about uh, the top, my, my top 10 reasons for being bivocational and uh, why it's a great option. It's not for everybody. And then I would love to share your answer. Hey, Ed, just going to answer your question about why bivo for me. Uh, I know some people do bivo because they want to get around a lost people and what have you. Uh, it's never been an issue for me. My wife and I actually have more lost friends than we do saved friends, probably. So for me, the bivo really is strictly uh, about the money and not to get uh, controversial or anything, but uh, the real reason, I guess you could say, why I'm Bivo is because most Christians don't uh, tithe or give regularly, <laughs> because if most of them did, uh, we'd never have to take an offering and I wouldn't have to work another job. But uh, so there's my two cents. But uh, also, you know, there is the benefit of you get to meet a different segment of people. But for me, it's really about the fact that uh, the full-time ministry just doesn't pay that well in most cases, unless you're a megachurch pastor. Nothing against them, but there it is. Hey, Ed, I'll chime in too. Um, uh, s similar to Wyman, but not exactly the same um, because 
uh, I think for for someone like me who is was already a professional, already um, uh, in a different stage in life, you know, kids with braces and private school and uh, mortgage payments and all that stuff, before you felt called to plant the church, um, that there really just is no uh, other option. Um, I just wouldn't wouldn't even feel right, even if I could raise that kind of money to uh, to support myself. Um, it, it would take years to do that, first of all, and, and second of all, it's just not very practical. So for those called uh, in the later in life who already have um, uh, an established life, um, Bivo gives you an opportunity to to minister and, and even plant churches um, in in ways that normal traditional church planting. Uh, models that, that require fundraising and all that kind of stuff uh, just don't do. Okay, see ya. And Ed, just another quick follow-up point to that is part of the reason I'm BIVO is because uh, I don't want to be limited in what I can do in ministry based on what the church can pay me. So I'd love to get to a point where it doesn't matter if or what the church can pay me, that I'm available and able to do whatever they need me to do. Hey, Ed and everyone. Um, Wyman, Charlie, I appreciate your contributions to this question. I appreciate the question, first of all. I was looking back in my Facebook um, page, and I was looking at the uh, church planner uh, page that Pete set up back, you know, earlier in the year, late last year. And I remember writing a post on there, and I went back and I pulled it up, and I read it, and I actually listened to it. I'm driving, and I cut out a segment of it I was going to post here for, so you could just have it for print. But I think what it really gets at is to say in this moment is that I am a bivocational church planter because I believe that this is the, the model that God gives us in how to live incarnationally with the people that we're called to minister to. That because of the professionalism that has really uh, become what people consider the clergy or the church, that ministers have been detached from the common man in everyday life, uh, because as they have seen us and perceived us to be um, lofty and, and, and detached from them. Um, now, in the black community, in the black church, the pastor has 98 percent of the time been bivocational. Uh, it's only within the last maybe, you know, 30 years that you've really seen, maybe maybe 30 years you've seen a uh, predominant number of black pastors becoming full time that that's like in the black church that was something that was that was like you know the the golden grail so to speak you know that that's it you know when you got to that point you know that that's right after or just as symbolic as burning the mortgage to the church uh and it would usually take a lifetime almost of a pastor's service to get to that point of cultivating a ministry uh, now it's it's a little it's a lot more common, but in that commonality has become a, even still this detachment from society. Where you know, we see the, we see the breakdown in the culture today. So um, being bivocational is something that I've always known that I would have to probably be a part of even before we were married. My wife and I discuss living a nominal uh, way of life that we would not be a burden on a church. Um, and then after, you know, becoming uh, into this place, and I actually, to be honest with you, you know, my article is kind of like pushing back against it with Pete because, you know, I, I look at it from different perspectives. It's not like something that I saw that we should be striving to do. I saw it as something that in the black church, particularly one of the reasons that our society is so broken, our culture is so broken is because we've been taken out of our faith has become misplaced. So, I saw the church really becoming um, called to take care of the pastor and take care of the people the way that they're supposed to, uh, because even though it was never really part of the, you know, the narrative, uh, it needed to be. And I was, you know, pushing it, trying to force it to be, so to speak, or rather just very frustrated with it because I saw that it wasn't. Um, so now I, 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 uh, but now my embracing of it is more of a theological, um, um, ontological perspective where I believe that we're called to live it out, to walk it out um, amongst the people, uh, rubbing shoulders with them as David smelled like the sheep um, and being able to go through life on life's terms without this um, 
this this air of of um, uh, you know I'm not saying it right, but you know what I'm talking about because that's the perception that has been cultivated in society. That's why pastors get very very little uh, street cred or social or so social cred now. They've they've lost that for the most part. You know, once you say Reverend so and so or Minister so and so or Pastor so and so. You know, someone gave it a, a air of 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 uh, respect. Now, you know, you'd be treated like that that European dude when Mr. Trump walked by him, gripped him up and moved him out of the way. <laughs> you know, so that's why being bivocational is important to me. Uh, but that speaks to why this group is also very important because this, and this is what my article also speaks to my post. What Pete has actually been able to create, Ian Payton, is a response to that in a very balanced, nuanced, and relevant way. Financially sound tools that we can use practically to lift our families out of poverty and to and to be um, to be confidently who we are. Just just a side note, you know, I wasn't going to share this part with you, but it kind of speaks to it a little bit. I was dealing with uh, interacting with the radio owner today earlier this morning, and. Um, he made a very offhanded remark to me, very disrespectful. And I knew where it was coming from. Um, but what happened, what, what I was so pleased about was how I did not internalize any of what he said. I, I Because of how Pete has actually helped me to uh, see myself in a much more uh, valuable way. I didn't let it rub me one bit. Um, because in his mind, he thought that because, you know, I'm a minister or a pastor, you know, I just I was I wasn't um, worthy of his respect. Um, so he was letting me know, you know, what the deal was. I was like, OK, all right. But uh, can we meet next week to do my recording for my <laughs> for my uh, interview for your radio program? That's all I want to know. OK, um, so that's all, guys. You know, just great question. Thanks for asking it. So I'm going to agree with a lot of what A. David said, but not nearly as eloquently. Um, but we are planting here bivocationally, and I can't tell you how what a difference it's made to be able to introduce myself as the technician at Capital Macintosh, not, oh, I'm here to start a church or I'm a church planter. Um, when I've led with that kind of statement, oh, we're going to start a church, it's amazing to see people immediately like tune you out, shut you out. But by being able to say I'm a technician at Capital Macintosh or hopefully soon a uh, social media uh, growth consultant, um, it opens up the conversation and you actually get to know the person. And uh, so it's been great to uh, extend relationships, being bivocational, to get into places that I never would get before. So that's the other thing my job has so far has provided a lot of opportunities to meet people and develop relationships with people that would have been a lot harder, I think, uh, just being, if I would have been fully supported or uh, uh, just being a full-time pastor. I know from being a full-time worship pastor how that uh, changes you. Uh, another reason is it gives credibility to what we're doing. Um, we're not doing this because we're getting paid for it. We're doing this because this is what Jesus has called us to do. And I'm not calling any other Christian to live missionally um, be, you know, that I'm not doing it, you know, I'm, I'm, you should live missionally, you should witness to your coworkers and, and people in, uh, around you, but I'm going to sit here in my church office and study my sermon all week. Um, no, nope, I'm, I'm doing it too. And I'm struggling with it too. And, and so I'm not going to, uh, lead you, uh, tell you to do something that I'm not doing myself. And we can actually lead people, uh, by example, uh, by being bivocational. Um, I think the other reason for us is one of our core values is give sacrificially. And we are actually trying to help people uh, learn to give sacrificially, not just to the church. In fact, sometimes not to the church at all, but to those in need. And so we're trying to do everything that we possibly can to reduce church expenses. We don't want to own a building if we don't have full-time staff then we can actually give more of our money to the community and to help people in need uh, because we don't have the expenses as a church. And so that's another reason for us to be uh, bivocational. Um, there was one other thing that uh, was going through my mind that 
no, I forgot. But those are some of the reasons why uh, I am bivocational, why I want to stay bivocational. And so I hope that helps you out. I just remembered the last uh, the last thing. Part of our organizational model is to be a multiplying network of communities rather than just a single location, uh, single you know Sunday service kind of church. And by being uh, bivocational and not having the goal of let's amass enough people, giving enough to bring me on full time, it's another way to kind of uh, force us to continue to multiply and develop multiple leadership. Um, is for me to continue to stay bivocational and have our other leaders be bivocational also. So it spreads the leadership load. Whereas if my goal is to become full time where I can lead and I can do everything or whoever else the other pastors and leaders are, um, you know, that, that I think that kind of stunts multiplication of leadership. And so um, staying bivocational, even having other leaders be bivocational, I can't do it all. I don't have time to do it all. I'm working full time. I'm doing all this. And so I need other leaders to help me out. And so it kind of forces us to multiply too. So that's another reason. Aaron, this is for you. Um, two things. One, bless you, brother. Uh, three things. Um, but one, um, your demonstrations of graceful living where you're doing things and you're redeeming parts of the community that are broken by extending gracious gifts of love to them. That's truly uh, at the root of our missional presence. And that's what's really going to be the only thing, the power that redeems these, these, these places we live and minister to, especially more that we see other religious institutions that are very law oriented, um, uh, escalating. The second thing is brother to your uh, platform. I really love the way you put that, that it kind of like, uh, it's indicative to create leadership uh, because of the necessity of leadership because you can't do it all, right? So I just wanted to ask you this one question, right? So how's that working for you? <laughs> Love you, man. <laughs> hey, guys, I want to chime in again on the uh, why Bivo thing. And, and I wanted to throw something out there. I'm definitely not trying to stir anything or or be the controversial one in the group, but you know, I, I think the key comes to, you know, being in your lane and what you're called to do. And I think man, some people are uh, called to be full time in the world. You know, some people are called to be a doctor and go preach the gospel to other doctors. And, and some are called to be bivo and be in both worlds. But uh, I think some are called to full time ministry and better operate in that. And it's it's come where almost it seems like uh, not specifically this group, but in general, uh, there's this trend almost to say that there's something wrong with being in full-time ministry and where like it's, it's a handicap or something not to have a, a, a secular job. And, uh, you know, I just want to say, man, I don't think it matters as much where you are, as long as you are doing what God's put before you. And, you know, I think the key is to be uh, of aware and to do the most with the opportunities God puts in front of you, man, because he's going to give every one of us opportunities to share the gospel every day, uh, whether it be in a secular environment, a church environment, what have you. And I think of uh, Jesus with the, uh, the woman at the well, when he sent his disciples into town to go get food, and he, they come back and he says, all you did is get food. He goes, I sent you in there and the harvest was ripe and you missed it. And he tells them, lift up your eyes. It's an interesting study to do a study on, on that uh, phrase in the Bible. But he's telling them, man, lift up your eyes. The harvest was ripe. And I think that's the key is to lift up our eyes and see what God is putting before us and where the opportunity is. Uh, but I do think that uh, there is also benefit to, you know, full-time ministry, because I find for myself, the more time I can spend away from not tied up in secular work, the more I can be fruitful and productive in the ministry. That's just me. I know everybody's not that way. Uh, but for me, you know, if I won the lottery tomorrow, I'm probably not doing any more secular work, but I'm still doing ministry at my church, you know. And uh, for many, many years, the ministry is just a labor of love. I've worked for close to nothing. I've worked for nothing. 
uh, full time in the ministry. So uh, I, I've been Bivo almost my entire life. So this is not a something against Bivo, but I just want to be careful that we don't try to take it too far the other way and almost make it like there's something wrong with full time ministry. Now, I'm not talking about these, you know, some pastors that maybe take exorbitant salaries and things like that. Uh, but most of us here are here because we don't want a uh, full time traditional 40 hour a week uh, work week. We're looking for something that we can do in less time so we can have more time for the ministry. Anyway, man, I'm not trying to be controversial or stir something up, but just kind of another side of the coin and uh, just felt like sharing some thoughts. Hey, hey, David, again, you know, I just want to respond to Wyman. Wyman, I receive your observations um, in love. I do, and I understand exactly what you're saying, and I support what you're saying uh, wholeheartedly. You know, um, depending on what side of the fence you're standing on, man, I, I think it's, you're absolutely right, you know, that we need to be cautious and use wisdom in how we promote any position that we call to promote in conjunction with the mandate to promote the gospel uh preach the gospel not promote it but preach it but i'm reminded of a conversation a friend of mine put on um facebook today about he took a a young man so into uh, the bank to uh open a bank account and he was rejected because he'd had uh i think he was flagged for having three uh, closed accounts within a period of three years something like that and a lot of people were coming on saying how they understood that uh, the banking system has these regulations in place to protect themselves and protect their shareholders and things like that. Um, and I just thought it was odd how when what I tried to communicate, I actually erased my post by accident, was that um, people that make regulations or people who make policies, many times they're looking at those policies without really taking into consideration the impact it'll have on everybody else, especially those people who aren't necessarily in their purview or in their um, in their sphere of relationships. And usually those are people who are um, who are caught up and most negatively impacted by those policies. Um, I'm just thinking about that in a, in a, because of the first thought I thought of, it's actually the second thought I thought of after you, uh, after I really walked through your observations was how uh, I think one of my, um, I, I don't wanna call it a complaint, let's all call it a criticism of, of full-time ministry has become developed over the years of having that group of pastors become very resistant and antagonistic towards church planters. Uh, not just myself, but others where it's almost like, you know, we're viewed as the pariah, the guy, the girl, the woman who's just being a troublemaker, doesn't want to play along with everybody else, who want to do their own thing. And they've taken an unbiblical stance. And some of it, mostly of it to their, because they've tried to maintain their own sense of, of, um, of influence or power or even revenue source. I'm very pragmatic when it comes to this stuff um, because I look at it uh, and I try to be as well balanced as I can um, as I try to be with this, you know, I'm always trying to see what my blind spot is, of course, as I saw your observation was, and I appreciated it uh, and I receive it and I will, um, and I did not take it as a personal, um, directed towards me at all. And, um, I just realized that, um, we, there's a reason why I believe this, this group has been, um, put together, um, and, I, 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 divinely, I believe there's a reason why God is doing this in our country amongst uh, the, the Western church because of the failings and the resistance to move the gospel forward um, because people have become so institutionalized and professionalized in the clergy. So that's my observation. I do believe you that you're right. You know, God loves all of us. He loves all his sheep and he's going to uh, have and maintain pastoral care for those persons and those congregations that that um, will grow and and thrive and even some just maintain in that capacity with that full-time pastor. But there's a different event that takes place. The church is so truncated with its growth today that it's not moving forward in, in saving souls. It's doing a lot of transplant, transference, um, 
and that's where the apostolic gift and the evangelistic gift come into play. Um, I believe I believe wholeheartedly that's why God is raising up such men and women today. But I, I and I support those brothers. I have dear dear friends and sisters in, in the faith who I love dearly in their full time capacity. Um, but if they invite me, <laughs> if they invite me to lunch, um, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm not afraid to talk about it. All right. Appreciate you, man. I do. And I appreciate your um, your candor and your courage. Hey, David, man. Hey, I appreciate your post, man. We all we all know some of the things you're talking about. We know those pastors who are territorial. We know the churches that are the Christian country club. Uh, we know all of those things, the churches that are professional churches. All right. But, uh, you know, you can be a pastor in any shape or form or a minister. You don't even have to be a pastor to, uh, man, to not be a good steward necessarily of what God's entrusted you with uh, and to uh, uh, abuse power and things like that, man. Uh, and I, I agree with everything that you uh, had to say. Certainly uh, my previous comments weren't directed toward you or anyone in particular, uh, but, you know, I think it just comes back to, again, look at lifting up your eyes, seeing the opportunities before us and being a, a good steward to what God's given us in whatever form that is, uh, whether it be full time ministry, bivo, secular jobs, what have you. So anyway, man, I appreciate you. And uh, I'm sure we'll hear some more comments from some of the other guys. Hey, Wayman, um, check this out, man. Um, and I'm sure others will chime in, too. I invite them to. This is good. And I always knew I'd like you as soon as I heard your first post. But check this out. I was at a kid's birthday party this weekend, and I met a pastor. And uh, we were sitting talking. And uh, he didn't let on that he was a pastor for a while, but I kind of I kind of knew. But um, I sensed anyway. Anyway, uh, I asked him, how was the work going? How was his ministry coming along? And the brother said um, he would he'd been there two years. He's an older brother like like myself. I, mean, I think he's a little older than me, actually. He'd been there two years, and the church he was pastoring had uh, had three splits within, I guess, within his lifetime. And that's kind of common, right? Small church here. And uh, anyway, I said, "So, what are you, how's it working? What are you doing? You know, how how's it working to grow a church? Because I'm thinking about moving right towards a church growth plan, right? Trying to sell him on a <laughs> trying to help him grow his church, right? And um, and he said. Um, He's, he's spending a majority of his time going and doing face-to-face -face contacts with people who've left the church. I guess it's in, in its most recent, you know, split or maybe the second split. I don't know. I listened to him. I said, well, how's that working for you? He said, it's not. He said, it's just, you know, it's very discouraging. You know, they say, you know, he gets a lot of lift service and nobody's really, so there's so many issues, deep-seated issues. Uh, that, you know, a conversation, him walking in the back is just not going to resolve for them, right? And I said to him, I said, well, let me ask you something, man. Did you ever think about going after the unsaved? <laughs> Did you ever think about going after the ones who don't know Christ, who have not been introduced to Christ, who, who are living hungry for God's grace? And he actually sat up and he said, you know, gosh, that's, that's good. That's, that's, that's a good idea. I, I guess I never thought about that. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. See, man, uh, we all need help. <laughs> I know I do. <laughs> That's all, brother. Love you, man. Hey, David. Hey, man, again, some great points and uh, great point about going after the unsaved. A, a lot of change churches get into that maintenance mode. Uh, and I think you're referring to that kind of in your previous post, you know, but just to throw out another reason why uh, a lot of pastors are going vivo is because a lot of the uh, established churches are in that maintenance mode. A lot of the established churches, you've got people with some fire to do something, to preach the gospel, to reach people. Uh, and a lot of churches are just about maintaining. Uh, and, you know, you have people that get raised up and trained up and have gifts and there's no outlet for them. So I think that's another reason uh, people do go by, though, is because they are looking for that outlet to preach the gospel, to use their gifts and uh, what have you. So anyway, man, appreciate you, my brother. 
Hey, David, again, appreciate you, man. I'll, I'll make this my last post on the subject. You know, uh, it's kind of a funny thing. I had a church that one time was calling me uh, a Bivo pastor. I said, man, if y'all gonna call me Bivo, that means y'all got to pay me. <laughs> so I was, uh, actually Novo or whatever, uh, working for free, but man, uh, Look, you start talking about, uh, man, people that are doing things outside of their giftings and don't know their giftings and how to use their gift. Man, that's my that's my passion. That's what I do all day long is try to help people uh, figure out their giftings and, and, and find their lane and their role within the body, man. So I'm all about that. I could I could get off on that tangent all day, but uh, for the sake of, of everybody else, I'll, I'll get off the topic here and uh, just listen to what some of the other folks here have to say. Hey, Ed, my reason for Bivo was uh, we're just not gaining traction as quickly as I had hoped early on. Uh, but even over the last kind of year, God has really been working on on my heart as far as just uh, wanting to be more involved in the business world, potentially even uh, fully um, engaged in that way. So uh, for me, it's kind of, I've kind of, over the last six to seven months, I've gotten to a place where I want to be fully uh, paid by a uh, bivocational situation. So I don't want to take any money from the church uh, or anything like that. So that in the future, if we're able to plant more churches, we can kind of have that model where we will equip uh, guys who uh, will equip people who have full-time occupations, full-time jobs with salary and benefits, and all that to start a Bible study, start a church, um, and uh, and they don't need to rely upon a, a major fundraising or anything like that. So uh, that's kind of my reasoning behind that. It's kind of where I've come to from this whole point. So hope that helps. Thanks. Hey, and the reason why I'm bivocational um, is not necessarily out of necessity. I choose to be bivocational because I don't want to be a burden on my uh, congregation. I've seen um, too many pastors that were full-time be uh, a burden to the finances of the church and um, really uh, degrade the ministry, overall ministry of the church. And it seemed like the church was just... um, Assembling just so that we can support the the pastor, uh, his housing, his insurance, his um, his retirement, and everything that was involved in supporting this pastor. And 95% of all the funds were going to supporting him, and and the five, rest of the 5% uh, was barely paying for um, the utilities of the building. So uh, I've seen that. Many times, not just in the most recent church, but in multiple churches, and it's probably something specifically in the denomination I was in, but um, I don't want to do that to my church. I want to be able to be, I want the church to be free from uh, the burden of taking care of my family and anything that comes our way for the church, whether up or down, that that will not be a factor uh, hindering the church or the ministry. Ed, I totally agree with A. David and Aaron and Wyman on uh, their their main points there. Um, I've been a full-time pastor, senior pastor, for about two-thirds of my ministry. I'm going on 26 years. Um, I was bivocational at the beginning, and I am bivocational now, and everything in between has been full-time. Um as long as you're serving the Lord and you're using your gifts and you're in the will of God, that's the main thing. Um, but I, over the last decade or so, kept having this growing conviction that I wanted to be financially independent from the church. Um, that would require being bivocational, um, but I just had to work myself in that direction. And I told Pete when I started to to be a consultant with him um, that, you know, my desire was to just get rid of my salary at the church uh, altogether. And I am at that point right now. Um, I do not draw a red cent from the church anymore. And um, it is a terrifying feeling. And it's also a very freeing feeling. It's great to know that any money that was coming to me is now going directly 
to those in the community that really need it. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that's right there in the middle of the sheep and I'm right there, you know, hearing the needs, knowing the needs. And now I know that my, you know, uh, my compensation is now going somewhere, somewhere else. And, um, I am at great, great peace with that. And, um, though my consulting has been somewhat delayed by me, you know, getting, you know, getting away from that dependence financially on the church. Um, I, I like the way things are heading for me now. Um, so, uh, would I ever be full time again? I don't know if that's the will of God, then that's the will of God. Um, but I have encountered, uh, a lot of pride from, from full-time ministry, um, from other guys. Um, I've encountered a lot of pride from bivocational guys as well. Um, kind of goes back to that. Well, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and well, I'm of Christ and, you know, always trying to decide who's better than who. And, um, you know, I, I guess there's just jerks at every level in every place, but, um, I just want to be where the Lord wants me to be doing what the Lord wants me to do. I know that sounds cliche. Um, but also one thing that I've discovered is, um, I, I believe it was Wyman, perhaps Wyman or Aaron, I can't remember, uh, who said, you know, I just don't have the time to do everything. Well, when you're full time, everybody expects you to have the time to do everything, which stunts the growth of the body. And what I've discovered now is that I can concentrate on my gifts and utilize my gifts for the kingdom. And that sort of even forces the rest of the body to to start doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be serving. I'm supposed to equip them for the work of the ministry. I'm not supposed to do it all. And uh, that's a big failure of, of the established church. Um, I planted uh, our church uh, about five and a half years ago. We started out with um, about seven families and you know, now we'll average, you know, almost 400 and, um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, so, you know, I, I go, you know, I start out by vocational, I end up going full time, but still had that growing conviction that I needed to be, you know, just financially separated from the church so that the church, could do the work of the ministry. You know, I planted, planted this church and feel led to start this church, to plant this church simply because uh, all, all the other churches that are in the area and the surrounding area really just wanted church to be for them and didn't want to do what it would really take to go out and reach the lost um, you know, this whole idea of country club and, you know, all that, man, I've lived it. Um, a lot of selfishness, um, just not wanting to have people in the building that aren't like everybody else. And, uh, so, um, we've been very, very blessed and God has caused us to be very effective in reaching, reaching people that nobody else has been able to reach uh, a lot of down and out folks, um, people who have lived very difficult lives, as well as, you know, even even some people who um, they've lived very difficult lives. They've had rough lives. The only difference is that they have a little more money than than others. But um, I don't know. I'm just kind of rambling on, you know, thinking, thinking about all of this and uh, really enjoy this discussion. But, you know, like I said, um, you know, the things that a David and Aaron and Wyman were saying, you know, I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally in line with as well. 
say Wyman and Ed, or uh, sorry, Wyman and A. David. Ed's the one whose fault this is. But um, I just wanted to, to throw in also my thoughts. I, I, I mentioned this a few months ago when this conversation came up, but I don't remember if A. David was in the group. I know you weren't Wyman, but you know, basically I'm totally in favor of there being full-time pastors. You know, some of the best and most influential pastors were not Bible, but full-time, like, like Spurgeon, like, um, like Jesus, like, uh, Peter, like, um, uh, DL, uh, Moody, like there, there's so many who, you know, gave up their, their Bible jobs or were never Bible to begin with to be go become full-time. And that's when God really used them. So I don't think, I, I understand what people mean when they say, you know, it gives them, um, more, uh, uh, clout, I guess, in the secular world and, and more um, reason for people to listen and, and stuff like that. But I by no means think this is a necessity. Whenever, you know, we could get in a box, it's like, well, this has to be the way you reach people. And it's like, well, that's, that's not how God works. Um, but I do think that specifically in this group, most people here are probably called to Bible. I'm not saying that, you know, what we're called to this moment is the thing we're going to be called to five years from now. But a lot of people in this group are apostolic. And I think out of anyone in the um, the fivefold ministry, if you kind of hold to that model and, and think about it that way, I think the, the apostolic gifting is by far the one that I think is meant to be Bible in a sense. Um, you know, whenever Paul talks about how, you know, you guys should have given me money, but, you know, I didn't want to take from you to, you know, ruin whatever. It's clear that there's plenty of people in that, that church who are receiving money to, uh, you know, operate in their leadership capacity, would be teaching or shepherding or, or, uh, prophetic or, or whatever. And, and it seems like the apostolic gift is the one that tends to be Bible because the apostolic one is the one that's uh, stretching, that's uh, giving the growing pains to the church to expand. Um, and that by necessity has to, not not by necessity, like it has to, but more often than not is Bible uh, because they are stretching it. They're giving the growing pains of the business, you know, just as just as a normal business, as it grows, you know, people put in longer hours for a little bit before they can hire that next staff member. That's kind of how uh, growing pains works. And I think apostolic people tend to uh, lean towards Bible ministry because of that, that nature of not wanting to be tied down to, well, if I can't expand it because the church is not funds, then I'm going to create my own funds, then I'm going to help expand it. And then, you know, once that next guy can go on full time, then I'm going to keep expanding again. And and I think that tends to be the, the mentality that I, at least I see with the apostolic ministry. Um, and honestly, that's coming from a guy who I honestly do not think I have that gifting. Um, personally, I see myself as a teacher and that's, you know, I wish I was more apostolic, wish I was more of these other things. Um, but that's just the situation God put me in. But I think especially the apostolic gifting um, leans more towards Bible because it's such a pushing forward, expanding um, gift which also means that those who don't have that gift, it's totally great for them to be in full-time ministry because that's, that's more of their leaning, more of where God has made them to be. Um, and yeah, it's sad that, like David said, there's the, the pastors who take that more as a territorial thing and like, a, hey, you don't steal my people or whatever, and they don't see the gift that the apostolic guy brings to the pastor and to the shepherd and to the teacher. Um, although they do fight against each other, yes, you do have the money thing, but also keep in mind, Peyton talks all the time about how the, the fivefold ministry, they tend to fight amongst themselves just because, not fight, but they rub each other wrong because they see them doing as things that they wouldn't do themselves and they see them valuing things that they don't value as much. And, you know, it's, it is a check and balance. And so don't grow discouraged, you guys, when, when there's people who are downplaying Bible. It's not just because of money sometimes. Sometimes it's because they just don't see it the same way because they have different giftings. Um, and also, like you said, Wyman, let's not let's not play down the full time pastors because we see things differently and we have different giftings that emphasize those different things. So that's kind of that's how I see it. And so uh, basically the reason I'm Bivo is, <laughs> yes, necessity. Um, but I very much love the potential that Bivo brings um, not only to conversations, but like I just said, trying to be more succinct for, for Ed's context of, of him using um, quotes and ideas is, you know, I really like how it can be a really an expanding influence in the church that, you know, when you're in those growing pains of you have a, maybe double the membership, but they're all new believers and they don't give all that much. And they, they're learning how to just be part of the body of Christ. You have the flexibility to jump in there with extra cash flow and extra um, help without the necessity of, of drawing from the church yourself. And so the Bible really helps with that. And not just to take with yourself personally, one of the things I look forward to with um, this consulting stuff is I want to build a business that I can hire um, other people, whether it be short-term interns or, or long-term staff um, from Redemption Church, um, sorry, our church. And um, 
and hire them to where I can supplement, you know, 80% of their income, the church can supplement some, and they only work for me, you know, 10, 15 hours a week. And they're able to uh, uh, do a lot more for the church. So I see Bivo not just as a short term or a single person thing, but if I can not just train other tent makers, but if I can just simply hire them for whatever term they are, whether our church or church plans we support, uh, if I can help them become uh, Bivo, but not have the the difficult entry that you and I have by having to create our own businesses, if I can just hire them and help them be Bivo and it give them, you know, exceptional salaries for low time and just spread that, that wealth and that opportunity, then that's, that's what I see with Bivo coming down the road and, and excited about. Hey, let me just chime in on the, uh, the why Bivo conversation, even though I'm not a pastor, I talk to pastors all day long. And as you guys may or may not know, um, I do a lot of texting. So people come through, uh, one of my webinars, and I'll text them. My system automatically texts them, and if they respond, I get notified, and I enter into a conversation with them. And so I was in a conversation with this one uh, pastor, and he was, you know, full time, and and uh, he basically he said, you know, and I we preach that you know you should be full time, uh, that Bible is not what you should be, and. If you do have to take a job, you don't do it in your own community. You do it in another community. And I just, I just told him, I go, hey man, you know what's really cool? And, and our, I can't remember the exact context exactly of what I said, but I'm like, you know, I'm going to be straight with you. You may not like the Church Planner podcast because you know he even referred to it as the A plan versus the B plan. You know, the A plan is full time ministry. The B plan is is bi vocational ministry. And I go, you may not like the Church Planner podcast because our goal isn't, you know, full-time ministry. Uh, in fact, what you call the A plan, we'd probably call the C plan. And we wouldn't tell people to go outside of their community to get a job. We'd totally tell them to get a job right in their community, you know, be a pillar of the community. And I go, but here's the really cool thing. And this really relates to what Wyman was saying. God uses both. Like, there is no right or wrong way. Sometimes God uses someone who's bivocational Sometimes God uses someone who's full-time ministry. And like Wyman was saying, he calls us to both. Like maybe at this point in your life, he's called you to be Bivo. Maybe at another time, he'll call you to be uh, full-time. You never know. But the cool thing about our God, he uses all of it. And what he's really looking for, and you guys all know this, I'm literally preaching to the choir. Um, what he's looking for is the heart, right? That's what he's looking for. He's just looking for someone who wants to serve him. And he will use you no matter what that is. Maybe it's Bivo, maybe it's full time. Kind of doesn't matter. And so, I mean, my response to that guy, I just kind of wanted him to understand look, dude, I, you know, we're more in favor of Bivo. You're more in favor of full time. Doesn't matter, though. We're both right. God uses both. And that's kind of the cool thing. That is absolutely true. And man, this is what I hate about full-time ministry snobbery. Um, some of the greatest servants I know are, are Bivo. Um, Sunday, we uh, we were off and uh, we went to uh, kind of a smaller, kind of out-of-the-way church. Um, the pastor was Bivo, but he has been struck with multiple sclerosis and is in a wheelchair. Um, he takes his wheelchair up to the platform and just barely able to stand. He struggles to get on his feet and hangs on to the pulpit and preaches a wonderful message about the body of Christ and spiritual gifts. And, you know, you just, you just had to admire this guy and appreciate his heart to communicate the gospel. And I've been full time most of my ministry. So, um, you know, I just, I've just seen both sides of that. Man, I can't really add uh, anything else to everything that's been said. I do want to say it's been awesome listening to everybody talk about this topic because it's evident how much you guys love pastoring and love ministry and love being in your communities and love your people. It was just exciting to listen to that. Um, that being said, I, I think I would drive home the point that Josh made um, about, you know, people who, it's my daughter, sorry, people who uh, uh, are being controlled by those who pay their salary. I've got friends, not church planners, but several friends that have taken over 
um, longstanding established churches as new pastors. And that's one of the biggest buck ups where you can't change this or you can't say that or you can't do that uh, because so and so who's one of our biggest givers doesn't want that or doesn't like that. And those type of things that oppose you, even if you feel like God is leading you in a direction, whereas I said under one pastor one time who earned his salary outside of the church. And I remember him saying one time, this is the direction we're going. And if you don't want to get behind it and you don't want to give to this, uh, frankly, we need your seat. So it was, he was a pretty straight shooter, but it was, it was a uh, great to see him build operate in that Liberty. He knew God had called him to something and he was going to go for it. Um, and, and those who were part of that body would be connected to it, would be in that vein and would support it. And he didn't have to worry about anything else. Lastly, just having been on the mission field all the time I have, you know, I'm going through something right now at my day job where, uh, people in another state in Florida are making, sorry, I got cut off, are making national decisions about adding all this extra work for operations, Excel sheets and stuff. We got a new COO and it's busy work that provides constantly changing information to them. It doesn't affect the bottom line, slows down productivity. And it's hard when you have people making financial decisions and ministry decisions that are disconnected from what you're doing. And we've built a lot of our church systems modeled after the world's systems. You know, we made these CEO pastors and these networks and, and it doesn't work for ministry. I mean, it, it builds that disconnect. And I had people when I was uh, in Brazil as a missionary, you know, back here in the States, making financial decisions, making um, uh, job decisions, making healthcare decisions and insurance decisions People who had never, ever set foot in the country, didn't speak the language, didn't know the culture, didn't know the law, nothing about it, were making decisions that affected my family. And in the time that missionaries and, and pastors, but missionaries I think of and I relate to because I was one, have to spend writing letters and begging for money and fundraising and traveling and not sharing the gospel, um, not sharing what the work is. A lot of times, but what, but begging for their survival, begging for funds so they could stay in that work another year. Um, it, it's just disheartening to see people have to do that to beg for support and waste that time to me traveling and, and trying to raise that money when they could have spent that same energy working on some bivocational project. Um, or if they had to support, stay in the ministry and stay in the field and keep doing what God called them to do. So those are some of the reasons that really touched my heart um, as a missionary and having a lot of friends that are that are pastors. Um, why I think the, the bivocational route is necessary at times and, and a blessing. That's it, guys. Good night. Man, I've been off this call all day. I've been assessing church planners in L.A., and uh, I miss the good stuff, man. So I'm kind of I'm kind of jealous. But uh, my day started off today with uh, leading my Uber driver to Christ. So that was kind of cool. In uh, Burbank, when I was grumpy, I had gotten on a train at 4:53 a.m. in the morning to uh, get there by eight. And so I was grumpy. I didn't feel like telling anybody about anything, more or less Jesus. So just proof that God does the heavy lifting. So hope you guys. Uh, had a great day. Can't wait to get into this conversation. Uh, Pete kind of gave me a heads up to uh, get on here and listen. So looking forward to digging in. Being bivocational allows me to be out among people. And I find that a lot of times uh, as a pastor, I can my life can become very insular. But even if I were being able to be paid full time by my church, um, even if they were able to provide for my full salary, et cetera, et cetera, I still believe I would work outside of the church office, eight to 10 hours a week, um, because it keeps you among people and it keeps you relevant and involved in conversations that are taking place. And by the way, most people who lead people to the Lord, uh, at least in my experience, are doing it in a context outside of church. And so sometimes you got to be outside of church. Why Bivo? Uh, for me, it's Jay from Toronto, Canada. Um, part of it is to overcome a call or a vow to poverty. Let me explain. This might take a little while, but I'll make it as short as I can. Um, my parents are from South Korea, and um, my mom's a nurse, and my dad was a dairy scient scientist, and uh, you know worked very hard. We're very, very, very poor. My mom 
um, uh, she lost both her siblings, one to uh, drowning in a pool, the other one dying of some sort of illness, and they were so poor they couldn't pay for medication. So her brother ended up dying because of lack of money to get medication. My dad is one of uh, 12 children, and uh, he became the most responsible, uh, even though he wasn't the eldest child. He had to go to the neighbor's farm, and in the middle of the night, in, in pitch black dark, there were no lights, and he took like a, uh, a little uh, bag, a satchel, if you will, in the middle of the night, and he would shovel uh, or dig the dirt, the, the neighbors, uh, the farmers, uh, ground to get either watermelons or zucchinis or anything that he could find to bring food back home. That's the context that they lived in, where um, life was tough, they were very poor. Um, they both ended up getting full rides, full scholarships. My dad went to Denmark for dairy science. My mom was in a nursing school at, in Busan. Um, they ended up both immigrating to uh, Toronto, Canada, or in the outskirts of uh, Toronto, um, and their education didn't translate here. And uh, obviously, because of that, they needed to find work. So um, they ended up working in factories, um, manual labor. The joke is, um, uh, do, you, do you know that Koreans um, are everywhere in the world? And why is that? And the, the punchline is, well, where there is a corner, there is a corner store, and the Koreans will own that corner store. And the other thing is, uh, Koreans are known to uh, own dry cleaners. We wash your clothes for cheap. That's a Chinese accent, by the way. So yeah, dry cleaners and uh, convenience stores or corner stores are owned by Koreans just because they need to make a living and it's the easiest low barrier job to get into. Fast forward to my call to ministry. I used to be a national sales manager for the largest bank in Canada, helping launch uh, a visa card that has done really well, helped oversee 1300 branches across Canada, traveled and did um, training materials and quality assurance for call centers, et cetera, et cetera. And when I got the call to ministry, my parents basically said, you're taking a vow or a call to poverty. And as a pastor or a minister of the gospel, you shouldn't own a house. Uh, you shouldn't have a bank account. You shouldn't. And all these rules of what you shouldn't do, because, you know, as a minister, you should be humble. You should be poor. You should be meek and all this, you know, uh, ungodly non-gospel-centered uh, theology. Uh, fast forward today, I'm in ministry. It's been <clears throat> over 15 years. Um, my house that I currently live in is actually kind of falling apart. The sunroom that I'm in right now um, has mold in it, and it needs to actually be completely ripped apart um, because of leaks. And like, there's a lot of problems with the house. It's a 60-year-old house. The car before this one, um, I had a 1993 Camry. So that's 24 years young. So <laughs> life is not easy as a, as a person in ministry, as, as you all know. Uh, now I have a newer 2004 van. Woohoo! Um, no, I, honestly, I'm very grateful for it. I give praise and thanks for it. Raising support for me has been, it's almost been two years. It's been very difficult. It's time consuming. And in, all, in two years, I still haven't raised all my support, let alone my ministry budget to travel across Canada, to equip the churches, to reach lost people. So I can't remember who said it just uh, recently before, but man, it's like two years and I haven't been able to really get to the work of ministry in the way that I want to. I mean, that's that's precious time uh, with souls being lost, you know, every second, every day, every week, every month, every year. And so that's been a real just crushing my spirit um, uh, dilemma with the financial aspect of it. And I'm still raising support. Um, I do have a passion, I do have a call and gift, and I'm a reluctant and accidental evangelist. Um, but being Bivo, why Bivo? Well, it allows me to be in connection with pre-Christians, people who will come to Christ, because I know they will by faith. And I'd say, in fact, about over 90% of the people that I have helped lead to Jesus or helped others lead, um, help others be equipped to lead Jesus, have been outside of the church context. What I mean by that is Sunday gatherings, house church or small group context has been all outside of that 90% or more. I've led people to Christ on the golf course. I've led uh, people to Christ on airplanes, just like uh, Peyton had, had led the Uber driver. I've led homeless people uh, to Christ on street corners, on multiple university campuses. Um, I've led people to Christ in ICU wards in the hospital uh, several times, actually. And there's, I'm sure we can make a podcast of that. 
people you know with liver failure, quadruple bypass, cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, man, I gotta, that reminds me, I got to write this accidental evangelist book, Stories of um, God Moving. And yeah, Pete, I think it'd be awesome for you to use this Bivo material for a podcast or a CD. I need Bivo for my family. I need the financial security and the income flow so that I can get out and equip the churches to reach the lost, especially those that are church planners like myself previously who don't have a budget or have very little money and offer them free consultation if possible um, so that we can reach more people for Christ with the gospel. And Bivo income will allow me to be free from these financial constraints. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's so much later than I would ever normally chime in on Boxer, but uh, just was tying up some things. I'm normally way crashed by now, but um, just wanted to get everybody's input into my notes here as I prepare uh, this uh, this video for tomorrow. And I just wanted to chime in. I know some of y'all on the West Coast, it's a little bit earlier here. East Coast folks, I'm sorry. I hope you're not, your phone's not buzzing and annoying you like sometimes it does me, but uh, I just have deeply appreciated it. Travis, your comment was hilarious. I, I really had no intention of stirring up such a long, uh, in-depth, passionate conversation, but I'm glad I did. And and Pete, run with it. I, I'm sure you will. So let us know when that podcast is. That would be great. I, I, I've just been really digging into this. Is, this is... Um, I, I'm trying to find my 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 niche, if you will. So uh, I, Travis and I've been going back and forth. We're we're starting this wedding pastors network and uh, and hoping that 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 goes real well. And I've just been thinking, okay, what's what's next beyond that? Where do I go? And I feel like this this bivocational um, area is uh, is such a growing passion of mine. I do want to be clear when I threw the question out. I, I know that there was some back and forth about. Um, by vocational or not. And uh, I, I didn't mean to bring that up in, in any possible way. So I absolutely agree with all of you who have said, uh, you know, it's, it's whatever, wherever God leads you. Uh, I probably would say that I want to be full time. Um, I, I would love that. I, I don't see that in my future. And uh, the longer that I go and, and hopefully the more money I can make uh, with my business or businesses, um, I, I, in, on the other hand, I hope I don't ever have to take a penny, but, uh, my biggest influences right now, I mean, outside of this circle, obviously Pete, uh, is huge and Peyton, um, and many of you, but, uh, I mean, my mentors are all full-time, you know, guys. And so uh, it, to me, that's a moot point. So just, I just want to clarify that I didn't mean to stir that up. And my question was in no way inferring that like bivocational is the better way or anything like that. Uh, just simply that uh, I want to address the benefits of it. Um, and I'm glad that some of this came up, some of the push, because I want to I want to state that clearly in my video and, and in the blog that I'm going to write. Uh, I, I want to state that uh, I'm not I'm not suggesting that Bivo is better, period, or it's right for everyone. It's just like with the consulting or with being a wedding pastor. Uh, it's not right for everybody, but uh, it could be awesome for for many. And so uh, that's definitely the bottom line for me. So however God leads, there's just a million and one ways. And uh, Travis, uh, unbelievable, man, that uh, being 20, I can't believe you're 25. Uh, I'm not sure that you're being totally honest about that. But anyway, your wisdom at your age, I know I've told you this privately, but uh, I, I wish that I was 25 in the position that you're in and your wisdom far exceeds your experience. And I'm so thankful for you. I think you're entirely right in the sense that those uh, that have that kind of apostolic, um, you know, gifting, like for me, I feel like I, you know, I'm constantly starting stuff and, and I frustrate, you know, teachers and, and prophets in particular. So uh, anyway, uh, just really blessed to have this conversation with you all. I've got 12 testimonies. I'm going to try to um, kind of collate them into a couple different topics. Uh, the topic of my video or, or whatever is 10 reasons why bivocational pastoring and church planning is a great option and how you can succeed in it. So uh, I got, uh, uh, you know, at least 10, but I'm going to try to narrow that down tomorrow morning. So again, if any of you are on uh, 12 o'clock noon tomorrow, Eastern Standard Time, you want to jump on Facebook Live with me and uh, would love your feedback. And we'll just continue the conversation and uh, let God use us in some amazing ways. So I hope you all have a great rest. Good night. And we'll talk to you tomorrow.
Well, everyone, thanks so much for joining us for this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just uh, cut it out right here. There's a lot more great stuff that happens in the Bible Inner Circle. I'd highly, highly, highly recommend if you ever get a chance, get into the Bible Inner Circle. Head on over to BibleInnerCircle.com. Check it out. See what we're doing. And uh, and I'm telling you guys, it it is mind-blowing. Um, the ministry insight you're going to get, the uh, income-making side, I mean, that's really what started the whole thing was hey let's show these guys how how I personally make money because I think uh, if they took it and did it they would uh, actually make the money that they need to make without having to as I say it sell their soul to the company store uh and and they could still spend the time with their family if they need to spend so anyway um go ahead and uh and head on over to bivoinnercircle.com and we will talk to you later thanks a lot guys Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Music